the gift that changes everything. Nothing was ever going to be the same again. That was the reality that Mary and Joseph had to acknowledge and embrace. The birth of Jesus had changed everything. The joyful news of the birth of Messiah, with all the blessings, peace on earth, forgiveness, grace, all those blessings brought with it a disruption that was noteworthy. And from that day to this, God has been continuing to gloriously disrupt the lives of countless thousands and millions of people, clearing out the old and making way for the new. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 22 and following, is the reading when sometime after the birth of Jesus, when the time of purification was ready, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord in accordance with the law of Moses. Luke 2, verse 22. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens first the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into the temple, and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. There is no doubt that when we enter into the kingdom of God and realize who Jesus really is and all the gifts and the goodness of God poured into our lives. It's no doubt that it's a time of celebration. But for many of people in the world, in areas of the world where the Christian faith is persecuted, and who knows, but some of these things may be happening and already are happening in Western countries and our own nation of Great Britain. For many of them, life is so totally disrupted and there is very often a negative repercussion from following Christ. Recently, I was in a country which I visit uh, and minister to converts to Christianity coming out of the Muslim faith. Today, many thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims are coming to learn that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Son of God and Savior of the world. I remember over a short weekend of seminars as I was presenting the teaching of the sword of the Spirit on the kingdom of God, so many people were blessed and, and one person in particular 
A young man came through for Christ in a very clear way. He, he saw it all and he immediately requested to be baptized. And after that weekend, he said, my life was transformed. And he went about sharing his faith in the normal open way. Well, he made many enemies, many enemies. He, he, he received death threats, threats of violence. And finally, they got him a hit and run car accident, deliberate hit and run left him at the point of losing his leg. He went for medical treatment and doctors refused to treat him for fear of reprisals from the fanatics. But he hung in there and he was so joyful. He said, let it be, whatever God, I, am, I think it is an honor to suffer for Christ. And, and this reminds us of the price that many people have to pay. And it shakes us out of our own complacency when we remember that the God of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a God who calls us to surrender everything to him out of joyful recognition of who he is. So when we take up the call to follow Christ, we can expect many things, many joys, many blessings, some of the things that the world could never give, money could never buy. The gospel fills us, floods us with the love of God, with the deep satisfaction of knowing Christ as we yield our lives for him. And all these things we can expect and enjoy, but along with these things, the gospel warns us to expect something else disruption, divine disruption. Mary and Joseph's life was totally disrupted. The gift was good news to a lost humanity and their privilege was unparalleled. God manifested in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Mary was carrying the Christ the Messiah, the seed of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom was a challenge, a challenge to all the powers and the authorities, a threat to every authority in heaven and on earth. It was a threat to every kingdom on earth. And we know that one day the kingdom of God is going to swallow up every other kingdom and God will reign supreme and bring in us into the new heavens and the new earth. So God was now personally, physically and soon to be visibly present on the earth. The seed of the kingdom was eventually going to manifest in all the earth and going to bring about this new world order which would have cosmic repercussions. And there is a one word for this that brings it all about and that's the word Disruption. Disruption. Many of our lives are disrupted at Christmas time. We are visitors from friends and families, those we love and those we know we should love. <laughs> but it's not a pointless disruption. There's a purpose in the Christmas disruption. And God, when He disrupts, He disrupts divinely. He interrupts in order to shape and reshape and make and remake our lives. And in the process, our whole lives become disrupted. Certain dreams must be shattered to make room for the bigger dreams, the greater story of God in our lives. Imagine with me what Mary's dreams were on the eve of that announcement that the angel gave to her. There must have been those of a normal, young, maiden woman for that time, for that place. She was betrothed to a man. She was longing for family, longing for a happy, peaceful life in that remote little town of Nazareth with her extended family, her childhood friends, taking up a respectable place in the community, secure in a little business, Joseph's carpenter's 
shock. But the announcement disrupted everything and actually shattered every one of those dreams. But Mary accepted the challenge. Do you accept the challenge today? After that announcement, extraordinary announcement by Gabriel the angel, Luke 1.38, this is Mary's response. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And in accepting that challenge, disruption hit her whole life. And every one of those dreams were shattered, but God gave her a bigger dream, a better dream. The Christmas story, as it's told today, very often glosses over the unpleasant, the uncomfortable, the difficult reality of the actual story. Think of the initial challenges that Mary had to face. First of all, she had to tell Joseph the news. Now, I wonder what it first sounded like in many homes and in my home occasions and many homes when the wife comes to the husband, a slight glow in her cheeks, a kind of joyful, coy look on her face saying, darling, I'm pregnant. That is often good news and joyful news, and certainly it's okay if you've been trying to conceive or if you're together with your husband, but it's a whole nother ball game if you've not yet had that opportunity. Now, Mary and Joseph were married. In fact, they were betrothed. And in the custom of the day, the betrothal is not like our engagement. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off again. The betrothal was where the marriage vows were made. That was the covenant commitment, and it was binding. But the sexual union took place well after the vows. Imagine having to make the promise and wait, whereas most people don't want to wait even without the promise. But that's a whole other whole other description. How different is our culture today? But it's important for us as a Christian community to uphold God's purposes for marriage. A man and a woman covenanted together to reflect the love of Christ for his church. And chastity, chastity outside of marriage and fidelity within marriage is the only way to honor God. My, 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 there's some awkward looking people today as a result of that. We need to get back to God's kingdom, God's rules. Remember, we serve Yahweh and it's always Yahweh, Yahweh. It's always his way. Now, I don't know what Joseph's reaction might have been. I can, I can imagine he didn't believe Mary. Pregnant can't be. No, you're not. yes, I'm pregnant. How do you know an angel told me? An angel told you, who is this angel? What's his name? And I can tell you one thing, Mary, he ain't no angel. <laughs> he didn't believe it. But when he was convinced of the fact, now he was in a position. Because she's pregnant. The child is not Joseph's. He couldn't quite believe the child was God's. I mean, that was too far-fetched. But he was honorable. He loved Mary and he said, I'll tell you what am I going to do. I'm not going to humiliate you. I'm not going to embarrass you publicly. I will arrange for a quiet divorce. But you and I, it's over. But I thank God that eventually God gets through to the men. What is it with us men? We're always last to hear. <laughs> Our wives often are the first to hear, and then they tell us, and we don't want to believe them until we hear. 
I remember one occasion when I came to Amanda and I said, Amanda, I've just got this amazing idea. And I explained the idea. She said, oh, yes, God told me that three months ago. <laughs> but at least God spoke to him. Men, it's time that you wise up, wake up and start to hear from God and take your rightful place in the kingdom of God. Men, men, men. And the people who are applauding the most are the women. <laughs> well, God did speak to him. He came late, but at least he joined the party. Now, the rumors of Jesus' illegitimate birth not only spread, but they stuck. You know, when you spread gossip and rumors, it's rather like emptying a feather pillow out in the field. The wind comes, blows those feathers all over the place, and they show up in unusual places years later. And the person who so irresponsibly spread these rumors will never be able to go around and pick up every feather and correct the story. Sometimes we feel the injustice when people gossip about us. Well, this picture stuck, and this stigma never, never went away. Later on in life, when Jesus was conducting his ministry and calling upon the people to recognize his true identity, many of the people casted, cast aspersions over the life of Jesus by referring to his dubious birth. In the Gospel of John 8, verses 41, Jesus speaks to these recalcitrant Jewish religious leaders and said, you are doing what your father did. Your father is the devil. And they said to him, well, we were not born of sexual immorality. We know who our father is. You don't even know who your father is. We are pure and we have one father, even God. How wrong they were. Do, do you know? The feeling. Have you felt it? Have you experienced it? That feeling when people gossip about you or judge you unjustly just so that they can reject what you stand for. We get many letters of encouragement and many letters of criticism. I remember one letter of criticism that came many years ago and it, it demolished me. It, it was absolutely devastating. And my first reaction was to find a way of blessing this person with the five-fold ministry. <laughs> then I realized, oh, no, no, no. Look, he doesn't know the half of it. So I wrote back this letter saying, my dear friend, thank you for your letter, although... I cannot believe a word of it. I am far worse than the person you describe. You're sincerely in Christ. And so we would be far less uh, concerned about our reputation if we were thankful for the, the little that people know. God knows everything and we are accountable to him. But when people do judge us unjustly or, or reject us and what we stand for, using some kind of excuse that will bring us into a bad light and ridicule us. When, when we identify with Christ, we can endure what he endured and he endures it with us. The misunderstanding and the willful disdain that comes from those around us personally and increasingly from our whole ABC culture. Anything but Christ culture. Well, those were some of the initial challenges, but the challenges didn't stop. They continued. The ongoing challenges dogged their footsteps right throughout the whole process. There were major challenges coming from two sections of society, the Jewish religious leaders and their persecution. Let me just say this. All the followers of Jesus were Jews. Jesus himself was a Jew, 
and many people accepted him, but the, but the Jewish religious institutions of the day were so far from God's purposes that not only did they fail to recognize Messiah, but they actually actively persecuted him and rejected him. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the other Jewish sects of the day persecuted Christ and his message. And even from the very beginning, Mary and Joseph had to endure a persecution and a violent opposition coming from one of the key Jewish leaders, Herod, whose title was the King of the Jews. And he certainly had his own messianic ambitions. He was the one who re restored and rebuilt the temple. What is that? Was he just trying to curry favor with the Jewish people? No, no, no. He was asserting himself as Messiah because one of the great expectations that Messiah would come, when he would come, what he would do was to restore the temple. And Jesus didn't have to restore an earthly temple. He was the temple of God. His his body, the temple, was restored and then raised from, the, uh, was destroyed and then raised from the dead that we might become the temple of God. Oh yes, he built the temple, but it was a temple that is open to all nations. And so Herod was threatened by the notion that the, un, that the wise men unwisely shared with him. Found out from the wise men the time and the place where the king of the Jews was to be born and then sent soldiers to destroy all those under 18 months in that place of Bethlehem. But being warned by God, Mary and Joseph took Jesus, the toddler, away into Egypt for safe keeping. Disruption, again, disruption to family life. When you are called, you look at your whole life differently. Did you know that? Even your family life. You follow your call. God comes first and you trust him with your family. There's a principle I find. Take care of God's house and God will take care of your house. But today, amongst a certain generation, there's almost a deification of the family as if their holy trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Family. Let me talk to you about the holy family. The holy family was persecuted. The holy family was separated. They had to endure disruption upon disruption, but they trusted God with the outcome. And so must we today. The best model you can set for your children, the best you can pass on to them is not the deification of the family, but a firm commitment. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can I have an amen in the house of God? But you know, in following Christ, we're never the losers. God has a remarkable way of turning things around to make it look that stuff which was bad happened to us actually was, he weaves it as part of his plan. Do you remember Matthew records not just the exile into Egypt, but the return from Egypt with these prophetic words fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. They were not helpless victims of geopolitical, geosocial, or geospiritual powers. They were in the palm of God's hand. They were in his will. And God's story was being written in their lives through their willing submission to the purposes of God. Stop trying to write your own script to your own movie of your own life in which you are the star. Tear up that script. Let God write another one, a better one, in which Jesus is the star. He is center stage. And if we have but a small part to play in the story, we thank God for the opportunity. So that was uh, something of the Jewish religious persecution, but the, but the Roman imperial persecution was equally intense, and that is exactly what condemned Jesus to death. We read really early on in the prophecy of Simeon. It's very interesting to follow Simeon 
He is characteristically a new uh, covenant prophet in, in many ways. His word was a word of affirmation and confirmation of what God had already re revealed. Old Testament prophets very often speak in a predictive way, talking about what is to come. And in many ways, prophecy today can be a wonderful way of encouraging you and strengthening you in what you yourself hear from God. And so Simeon says, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise. You know, they say what goes up must come down. And in kingdom terms, what goes down must come up. It's the opposite of the world. It defies gravity. It's according to a higher law, the law of the spirit, the law of the kingdom of God. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. We need to fall off our own pedestal before we can be lifted up. The fall and rising of many. And as a result of this, there will be a sign which will expose the thoughts and the hearts of many people. And in the middle of this, in my Bible, it's put in parenthesis. There is a side word in which Simeon sees the suffering that Mary was going to have to endure to see her son rejected and beaten. She was one of the few who stood by the cross. And you cannot imagine what it must have felt like for her as a mother to see that happen to her son. She was devastated and Simeon had warned, a sword is going to pierce through your soul. It was not going to be an easy mission for Jesus and not going to be easy for those who followed him. Nothing has changed. It still costs everything to follow Christ. The young man that I showed you, it's cost him something. He's prepared for it. And thank God we all don't have to go through the same levels of tests. But one thing we need to remember is the little baby in a manger on the Christmas card at Christmas time is not the whole reality. See him in the manger, yes, but see him ultimately crucified on the cross, despised, rejected, his life poured out as a sacrifice, extinguished on a Roman cross, all because he was a threat to imperial power. I declare to you, the name of Jesus is still a threat to all powers, all authorities that do not submit to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing has changed. But of course, his kingdom is not despotic. It's not the kingdom uh, of, of some deranged demagogue. It is a kingdom of love, a kingdom of reconciliation a kingdom of hope, and all because the one who was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, despised and not esteemed. Verse 4 of Isaiah 53 goes on to say, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. Follow the Christ of the cross, though it cost, though there be devastation, though oftentimes there may be pain, but we know that it's worth it all because we're on the right side of God's history. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. What sorrows await those who go all the way with God? I want to ask you a question. When we, quite naturally and our culture encourages it a little bit too much in my view. But when we are longing for acceptance, emotional fullness, we want to escape from shame and humiliation. Can we identify with this man of sorrows and the disruption he brings? Can we willingly accept the rough with the smooth? Or will our longing for 
the comfortable, satisfied, fulfilled life win over the call of the cross. Well, the Christmas message will not allow us to escape divine disruption. The kingdom of God truly received will disrupt everything, gloriously so, for all the followers of Christ. Many of our dreams will be shattered. So many of you have had a microphone, you get a story, say, before I became a Christian, this is what I was expecting. This is what I was looking for. These were my plans, but God destroyed all those plans. But hallelujah, he's given me a better plan and a greater story is being rolled, uh, being formed, not from my own imagination, but the divine script writer in heaven who pays attention to every detail of our lives and brings us into his glorious purposes. Amen and amen. Yes, our dreams may have to be shattered, pushed to one side. Our personal, narrow, selfish, and often small ambitions must die. We must suffer this loss, embrace it gladly, because God is doing a bigger thing. The Christmas story is the story of a kingdom entering this world. And as I've been saying in this series, we carry Christ within just as Mary did. And just as that Christ child disrupted and changed everything for her, it will disrupt and change everything for us. God's gift to us is absolutely free, but it may cost us everything we once thought dear if we're going to truly follow Christ. But if that is the case, we can only rejoice because God's ways are higher and better than our ways. We are part of something still seen as small, easily despised, fragile, easily rejected. But it is a story that is being told and will one day be so obviously great and glorious that we will never regret the moment we identified with that one-time child, now not only crucified, now not only raised from the dead, but ruling and reigning in heaven, soon to return to this earth in all his glory, to transform everything and claim us as his own. The divine disruptor is with us Today, let him have his way. Learn from Mary. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Why didn't you repeat that after me? I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We are on the right side of history. We can expect all the blessings of the gospel, but also expect divine disruption in which God sweeps away the old to make room for the new. (laughs) 